Good everyone and welcome to our Goodfellow webinar tonight on supporting patients with lived experience of trauma. My name is Dr. Courtney White and tonight I'm talking to Anna Elders, a mental health nurse practitioner and cognitive behavioural therapist and has been supporting clients with a lived experience of trauma for 20 years in a variety of roles. So I'll now hand over to Anna Elders. Thank you. Kia ora everybody and thanks very much for your time tonight. I realise that um, for those of you watching this live it's pretty late in the evening and you've probably all had a really busy day so I'm going to try and be as concise as I can but just a warning um, I like to talk so uh, I'm going to try my hardest to keep to time and um, be as interesting as I can. Um, if you want to ask any questions Courtney's going to screen those and throw any up that are really relevant to what we're talking about at the time otherwise we'll try and get to them at the end. Um, so like Courtney said I've been a um, mental health nurse for um, around about uh, 20 years coming up. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see it um, and I became a cognitive behavioural therapist about 15 years ago when I went across the UK um, so, and more recently over the last four years became a mental health nurse practitioner. So I work for Tamaki Health um, and a GP practice within the PHO there. And I'm also the clinical lead for um, Just a Thought, which is a um, free online ECBT uh, course. So um, if you haven't heard about that, please go and check it out. So um, that's a little bit about my background. I've worked with um, people experiencing trauma for um, a very long time, but first and foremost, um, just to share a little bit about myself, um, and, and just th there's a context for this about thinking of those of us that come into the um, helping sort of uh, professions, um, is that many of us have, ex uh, have experienced trauma ourselves. So um, what I realized when I began looking into trauma as a health professional was looking back over my own uh, childhood that I'd actually experienced six types of adverse childhood experiences myself by the age of 13. Um, so that's me as a, as a little wee kitty there. Um, so that has absolutely shaped my life. It shapes my practice. It shapes my worldviews, thankfully, um, largely for the better. Um, but of course, you know, there was also um, a range and, and it's been interesting learning about trauma and looking back at, at sort of subsequent traumas that followed on from that. So that sort of fits into um, what I've, everything that I've learned and fits with the research. Um, and interestingly, the more that I discovered as an adult, um, sort of the ways that my education and, and, and my practice and a lot of my patients' experiences fit with mine was uncovering the um, the sort of generational aspect to trauma um, and that my mum had experienced four aces in her childhood and my father seven and that uh, childhood adversity and trauma go back about at least four generations in my family. So um, the reason that I sort of decide to be open and share that is um, one, I suppose, walking the walk around um, attempting to really help um, people to become more aware of and more open talking about the realities of traumas that we experience as human beings and also because um, of the commonality um, of trauma. So I, this is just a little bit of a disclaimer for you now that I've talked a little bit about the context of trauma for me personally. Um, trauma definitely induces conscious and subconscious denial and avoidance. It's one of the ways as human beings that we cope with a lot of the things, a lot of the suffering that we experience throughout life. Um, but we also know that trauma is really universal and hopefully by the end of this webinar you'll have a real sense of how sadly prevalent and universal trauma is for, for people. So there is a really good chance that um, many of you listening to this webinar tonight and uh, or later on in the recording will be carrying trauma, um, whether you are consciously aware of it, whether you um, you know, uh, are fully aware and, and, and think about it on a day-to-day -day basis or not. But my one um, request is that you take care of yourself during this webinar and also beyond it because you know, trauma has an imp interesting impact on people and talking about it can be um, quite triggering and, and trigger a range of different emotions and reactions. So just take care of yourself during this. So just to start out, we're gonna cover three major focuses over this webinar. So the first is having a really good look and think about what exactly uh, trauma is. We're then gonna move into having a, 
a bit more of an in-depth thing, uh, look at particularly how does trauma impact on us um, from a, a real biopsychosocial view. And then finally, we're going to have a consider uh, how you can make a difference to the people you support within your area of practice within your work. Um, so jumping straight into it, we're going to start out just having a really brief think about what exactly is trauma. So trauma um, is, is a very complex topic because we know that there are lots of different experiences that we can have. Sometimes we wonder what can be classified as trauma. Um, we are aware that there are, is what we call simple traumas, which are sort of one-off experiences that we may um, encounter, like a car accident, for example, um, or what we call more complex trauma, which is perhaps traumas that are more complex in terms of how they uh, carried out, whether it's um, you know who we experience the trauma by, for example, a, a parent, or uh, how that trauma fits into our life, or how much trauma we experience, how many traumas occur um, together. So th there are two important parts when we think about trauma. One is definitely the trauma event themselves. Um, that's the the first, uh, obviously and you know evident part of trauma so that distressing event or experience that poses some harm to our psychological physical spiritual relational and emotional well-being so that's the first part but the second part that we don't often think about in terms of what encompasses trauma is the second uh, more potentially overwhelming suffering that impacts following so we have the actual events themselves, the trauma events, and then the, the trauma really hits in in terms of the impact that it has on people afterwards. So we're going to jump into a little bit more of that and think about that more in detail now. When we consider trauma, we've got to become aware of the realms in which we can experience uh, trauma and adversity. Now, just to introduce ACEs, if you haven't heard of the term ACEs yet, uh, it's short for adverse childhood experiences. So this slide in particular is talking about childhood adversity or childhood trauma. Uh, but as you can imagine, these traumas can be experienced right across the lifespan. So firstly, we begin to, when we think of trauma, we can think about trauma that can happen within our households. So you can see a range of different experiences there from um, children experiencing divorce within their parental relationship, um, experiencing homelessness, parental mental health difficulties, um, there being substance use issues, emotional, physical or sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, so or family members becoming incarcerated. So, you know, that first realm is, is what that, that direct environment that the childhood's growing up in. And of course, as well, those significant attachments um, that the, those ch that child has or those children have with with their their parents or their um, you know the, the significant adults in their life. The second realm is the trauma that can be experienced within the community. So um, anything from poverty through to lack of jobs, racism, um, historical trauma, violence within the community, discrimination. Um, food scarcity. So there are a range of different traumas that people can experience within the community. And as you can see there, with that sort of depiction of the root system um, being really integral to the, the to the tree that's growing above it, um, so too does those community traumas really impact some of the traumas that children can experience within their home. Um, obviously, we think about the links with poverty and the risk of um, violence or drug and alcohol abuse, for example, that can come with that as a, as a secondary result. Uh, and then the third realm is obviously within the environment and very appropriately there you can see, um, you know, we can experience traumas through pandemics, um, which we, we all know is, is the case today. I've just been talking to um, a patient who has experienced a lot of trauma over COVID just due to the unrest. Uh, we've got things like climate crisis and we know we predict that there are going to be more traumas that are going to happen around the world um, that people would experience directly because of that um, storms, sea level rise, um, natural disasters. So they're the three realms in which we can experience trauma and that's helpful to, to hold in mind and really if you look at the, these three realms or these three environments um, they, they very much interact with each other. 
So introducing now a pretty integral study that I'm hoping um, by 2021, most of you would have, would have heard of or may know quite well. And that's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. So this is a very key um, piece of research or, or it's, a, it's a longitudinal study. So there's a lot of research that comes out of this uh, study. And it's one that I would definitely encourage you to look more into uh, if you're working with human beings. It's a pretty essential must know if you, if you work in, in the field of um, you know, healthcare or education or social services. So the Adverse Childhood Experience, or the ACEs study, as it's often referred to, was actually prompted by a, a clinician over in California who was working in, in um, an insurance company-led preventative medicine program, um, Dr. Vincent Folletti, and he began to notice that there was a high dropout in obesity clinics of people that were successfully losing weight, and he became very... Um, thoughtful around what was happening and quite confused as to why these people were leaving the program despite successfully losing weight and so decided to look into that and discovered that many of the people that were in the clinics and of course those that were dropping out had a history of childhood sexual abuse so that really um you know, threw up a lot more questions for Dr. Folletti. And he got together with Dr. Robert Ander um, from the CDC over in America and decided to conduct a longitudinal study into the prevalence and the impacts of childhood traumatic experiences. And this is how the EA study was, was born. So a sample of over 17,000 Americans participated and were recruited between 97 and, uh, sorry, 95 and 97. The sample were largely white Americans um, that were uh, middle class, middle aged, they were college, college educated and they were paying members of an adult health plan. So that's how they were recruited through that plan. So as you can imagine, um, this is a group that we may expect didn't, wouldn't necessarily have a large amount of trauma. They were paying members of, of, a, uh, of a health plan. They weren't um, you know, the, the members of um, society in America who couldn't afford to pay um, into health plans. Um, and so what was done was over that time and since, because the study continues, um, there were comprehensive biopsychosocial evaluations, including trauma screenings done within that sample. And there were further health and healthcare utilization monitoring that's happened over time. Um, so there's some real crossover with the Dunedin studies that are happening here in New Zealand, um, to some degree looking at um, early experiences and how that sort of is showing up in people's lives later on. So firstly, looking at prevalence, what really amazed um, the, the study, um, the researchers of the study was the high prevalence uh, so within that study, and again, we're remembering, um, you know, that these are people that we would perhaps expect to be on the lesser end of being affected by trauma, but trauma was absolutely found to be um, very high within that group. So 28% of the sample had experienced physical abuse, 21% had experienced sexual abuse at some time up to the age of 18. Um, we're talking about substance abuse within the families of these people growing up when they were children was high, um, divorce rates, which probably isn't one that we would be um, that surprised about, um, mental illness within the family, domestic violence, and you can see emotional neglect um, and physical neglect there. So what they determined um, for the important uh, discovery is that um, only 36% of that sample of 17,000 plus reported no childhood uh, adversities. 26% um, reported that they'd experienced one, but it, it went on from there. And so 12% of that sample experienced four or more um, categories of adverse childhood experiences. And we're going to look at those categories in a second. So what was really identified and, and really proven with the, um, you know, the, the sample size was that ACEs, certainly over in America, um, are very highly prevalent in society and in um, so, you know, socioeconomic uh, members of society um, that, that aren't living in poverty and aren't destitute. Uh, the other thing that was discovered was that ACEs are really highly interrelated. So childhood experiences really um, are connected to each other. 
when, uh, 81 to 98 percent of people that had one childhood adversity uh, reported at least one other additional category. The other thing that's been found, and we're going to talk more about this now, is that adverse childhood experiences display a real dose response relationship. So in other words, the higher the number of childhood adversities, the greater the risk of negative impacts um, across the board over the lifespan. So we're talking about a higher risk of poor physical health, uh, poor mental health outcomes and poor social uh, and well-being outcomes over that lifespan. So just having a quick look here, these were some of the adverse childhood experience categories. So you can see we, they were looking at childhood abuse, um, emotional, physical and sexual trauma that was occurring within that child's um, household environment. So parental substance abuse, divorce or separation, uh, parental mental health difficulties, um, domestic violence, uh, a household member be, um, being sent to prison, loss of a parent through death, suicide or abandonment, and then child, childhood neglect, abandonment or physical or emo emotional neglect. What they discovered further was that as a result, when they looked through the um, lifespan of, of that, that uh, participant, that there were high correlations between childhood adversities and evidence of disrupted neurodevelopment, um, difficulty controlling anger or rage, so emotional regulation problems, mental health problems that you can see there, um, flashbacks and dissociations. So that's the neurobiological effects of the trauma. And then from that, we're of course, uh, and this is where it becomes not so surprising, a greater a number of what we call health risk behaviors and they're often called um, coping mechanisms coping behaviors within the, the sort of the, the the trauma field so people taking up smoking gaining weight becoming physically inactive attempting um, suicide um, uh, using substances um, sexual promiscuity repetition of the original trauma so that's uh, as an adult that trauma becoming repeated. So whether it was um, someone experiencing childhood sexual abuse and then experiencing um, sexual assault or rape as an adult or domestic violence in their, in their relationship with their partner where it's been present with mum and dad um, and perpetuating interpersonal violence. And then what was seen were the consequences of uh, and we're going to really look into this because this isn't just the consequences of those health risk behaviours. We're also looking at direct impacts of the consequences of that early trauma and the way that sets that person up. So everything from increase in risk of cardiovascular disease, cancers, asthma, um, STDs, um, fractures, and then through, of course, to the higher rates of serious social problems that occur over the lifespan, everything from homelessness, um, criminal behaviours, um, struggling to sustain employment, re-victimization, intergenerational transmission of abuse. Of course, we're talking there about um, and you know acting out some of that uh, abuse to children and young people, um, and long-term use of health, uh, correctional, social, behavioral services. So when we look at this through the lens of New Zealand, you know some statistics that were taken. Um, you know, some time ago, showed that around five out of 10 people in society have experienced trauma. So that's about 50% of New Zealanders will have some experience in childhood or otherwise of, of trauma. Um, those rates very sadly are higher within um, Māori, um, higher still for people that uh, find themselves in um, the prison services uh, and even higher still for people that are accessing mental health and addiction services so you know uh, up to 90 percent of people accessing those services have a history of trauma so this does really show us that trauma is absolutely prevalent within our society too. And we know with our rates of childhood sexual abuse and violence and things like that, we, we already know this to be true. Um, but, you know, we don't, I 
don't think that we think about it enough in our day-to-day -day work. I think it's something that naturally uh, we, we have an awareness of, but it sort of sits in the background. And, and, and that's partly because I think, you know, trauma is not a nice thing to talk about or think about. Um, it becomes significantly harder if we ourselves as uh, in healthcare have our own experiences. So we'll think about that soon. So listen, how does trauma impact on us? This is where we really get into the nitty gritty. And those of you, especially that perhaps are working with people in, in terms of their physical health problems, uh, this becomes a very interesting part of the, the webinar. Firstly, I think the most important thing for us to consider um, and this comes from an amazing physician over in Canada. I don't know if I'm going to get his name right, but Gabor Mate, I believe. Um, his family were survivors of the Holocaust. He's Hungarian. Um, he's worked in a lot of different health fields, and he's now an absolutely amazing trauma expert. And if any of you were able to catch the movie that was released um, just over the last two weeks, The Wisdom of Trauma, um, if you haven't seen it, you must watch it. Um, it's absolutely essential viewing for anyone uh, working in, in healthcare or educational social services or anyone working with human beings. Um, and it's really inspiring. So this quote really comes from him. Trauma fundamentally means a disconnection from self. So one of the most uh, tragic impacts of trauma, and this is whether it's happening in childhood, whether it's a simple trauma that happens in adulthood, say a car accident, for example, is that trauma really risks fu fundamentally disconnecting us from ourselves. So how does that happen? You know, why do we get so disconnected from ourselves? And the simple reason is because it becomes too painful to be ourself. So anyone who has experienced trauma or, is, or who has worked with someone that has experienced trauma will be more than aware, and we're gonna jump into this more, of the way that trauma changes our worldview. It becomes often life and world shattering. Uh, it makes us question everything that we knew, uh, our sense of ourself, our sense of other people, the world and our future. And it can create such a degree of intense pain that when we're being present with it, it becomes almost unbearable. So, uh, you know, what commonly happens uh, when something becomes very distressing or difficult for human beings, our first port of call is to avoid um, and in some ways, that's a survival uh, technique, if you think about how we've learned to do that around, you know, over time, around anything that was poisonous, dangerous, um, that, that risked our lives, um, we, we learned to avoid. And so too, unfortunately, that's a real go-to for people when they experience trauma. So they are therefore left with that perception of themselves and others in the world and the future. Um, and that trauma often doesn't get processed and they don't get a chance to reconnect to themselves. Um, this is a really potent um, picture on the left here. I don't know if it's on the left or the right of your screen of a young person here who, uh, and you can imagine the figure looming behind is almost like those negative beliefs that have been evoked through something terrible that's been happened, that's happened to this person. And that sense that you're a nobody, you don't matter at all, you know, um, they don't care about you. Um, you know, and this is a, these are frequent core beliefs that I hear on a day-to-day -day basis of, of people that have experienced different types of trauma. So what happens is that that trauma can lead to a lifelong dynamic of disconnection. So people can uh, begin to struggle with relationships. I don't know how to deal with relationships because essentially relationships, unfortunately, as much as they, as joy they, they can bring us, they also cause us a lot of pain. Um, people can struggle to know how to deal with emotions and um, they can struggle to know how to regulate and so can begin to start to want to detach from all difficult emotions and you can imagine where that leads in terms of substance abuse or um, other ways that we try to escape distress and essentially struggling to know how to deal with life because again life is the Buddhists had it right life is full of suffering 
So what happens over time is that we see this, um, you know, those early experiences of trauma, often, unfortunately, a lot of the trauma does happen in those really early formative years. It has a major impact on our stress system or our um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So it, it wires that um, axis in terms of how our stress system operates. And of course, we have our early local environment, so our immediate environment around us that is very influential. And that sets out what we uh, understand in, in CBT um, or in a lot of sort of psychological approaches is what we call our core belief system. These are, it's almost like our blueprint or our roadmap for how we understand ourselves how we understand other people, the world and the future. And a lot of that goes into fueling our predictions of what we think is going to happen and making sense of the world, predicting what's going to happen from moment to moment. So those core belief systems and those early experiences and the stress that we undergo absolutely impacts our cognitive functioning, um, our you know, neurobiological um, function the way our brains wire, um, that toxic stress has major impacts on our growth and development as children, uh, it, it affects our ability to emotionally regulate when distress shows up, so um, you know how to look after ourselves, how to, to keep a, a wide open flexible range of ways of seeing things and being able to make good choices. Um, it fuels the, the rules that we live by in life, how we operate life to try and protect ourselves. Of course, all of that filters into the way that we have relationships, um, our coping behaviours, our worries and, and negative thoughts on a day-to-day -day basis, our ongoing sense of self. Um, and I don't know if there's anything above it because I've got a current slide covering it. And of course, our external environment as well as adults is reinforcing all of this all the time, all of the experiences that we have. Um, so you can absolutely see how those early experiences, those early relationships and attachments and the quality of those or not really infuses through a human being right throughout their life. Uh, and this is where we sort of come a cropper. So the lifetime effects that we can experience from adverse childhood experiences or, or traumas is that during that critical and sensitive developmental period, things can really go awry. Um, when those experiences are there, we're, we're aware that we now know that there can be epigenetic changes that can happen for that child um, as that experience triggers gene expression. Um, so, you know, the brain is absolutely affected in terms of that development of those early years, and you can start to see that um, stress and that trauma uh, becoming hardwired into a person's biology, um, the uh, adaptation of the brain as it's undergoing, you know, this continued trauma. And so, you know, further is, is um, all of the, the, the risks that can come from that. Um, the consequences is that young person grows up in terms of what happens with their education or their work, um, their cognition, their mental health, their substance use, um, their behaviours within society, their ability to, to um, you know, go into um, education and get high paying jobs or not, um, chronic disease. So we're going to have a little bit of a deeper look into this because this is where it gets really interesting. One of the things that we have to be really aware of, and this is where I would love to see health uh, particularly beginning to really focus on so that we uh, can stop being the ambulance at the, the bottom of the cliff, is the reality that um, children's, our, our children's exposures um, within New Zealand and outside of New Zealand to adverse childhood experiences are the greatest unaddressed public health threat of our time. So we really need to start seeing, uh, you know, the, the challenge of, the tra of trauma being ongoing, about it, uh, you know, continuing in our communities um, and the effects of it being unaddressed into adulthood as being a major threat to public health. So um, Dr. Robert Block, who was the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, you know, absolutely... Um, said this at one stage during one of his speeches and it's something that I think 
you know, our Ministry of Health and our health services and our health system um, here in New Zealand and, and absolutely overseas need to really start paying full attention to if we want to make a difference to health outcomes and social outcomes in New Zealand. So why is this? When we To understand why it's such a risk to public health um, and such a significant impact on uh, uh, all the st stats out there in terms of health and mental health and social um, outcomes as well, we need to understand stress. So Hans uh, Salier uh, undertook some of the early studies on stress and began to identify in animal uh, studies that physical and emotional stresses caused pathologic changes in, in lab animals over time. So exposure to uh, emotional stress led to things like stomach ulcerations, enlargement of adrenals, um, shrinkage of lymphoid tissues in those lab animals. And over time, there was the development of various diseases that are seen in human beings when stress was persistent. So those lab animals with that continued stress went on to develop heart attack, stroke, kidney disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Now these lab animals didn't take up smoking to cope with the stress from um, you know, what they were, they, they were experiencing. Uh, this was all a direct result of that stress and the impact that it had on their um, major systems. So Salier really began to challenge the belief at that time that diseases were caused by individual pathogens and instead proposed that there were many different assaults or many different stresses that could cause the same diseases, not only in animals, but in humans as well. So Salier's so research on stress has been, um, has you know, continued and it's being refined. And we're now looking at uh, the different types of stress. So we know that stress can be positive. You know, we need stress. Um, there's definitely identification of people who, um, due to different biochemistry, don't experience enough stress. They don't have enough exposure to stresses uh, and to stress hormones in their bodies and they're too laid back. They don't get things done. So we know that we need stress in our life. And of course, positive or helpful, healthy stress um, you know, has that brief impact in elevating heart rates and stress hormones to help us take action and get things done. Um, then there's tolerable levels of stress that are more serious but temporary stress states and are often buffered by supportive relationships or different resilient factors that are out there. So it's not ongoing and people can cope. But then there is um, now the, the definition of what we call toxic stress um, or the other way that it gets referred to all the time, and this is really um, significant for people in physical health, is what we call chronic stress. So chronic or toxic stress is the prolonged activation of stress response systems in the absence of protective relationships or protective resilient factors within that person. And when we see the results of toxic stress, or chronic stress, we begin to see alterations in that uh, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, the way that the stress system runs. Uh, in children particularly, we know that it causes developmental delays. Um, it absolutely causes inflammation because don't forget that once you run out of cortisol, um, that cortisol is there to protect uh, inflammation with a, a, around the body. Um, so if you have, if you're not, if you no longer have enough of it, then you begin to see systemic inflammation taking place, metabolic changes, oxidative stress, epigenetic changes, and then of course all the behavioural challenges that come um, when people are trying to adapt to that stress and lower that stress through some of their coping mechanisms. So we only need to look at some of the responses out there to COVID-19 uh, and the stress that was caused to understand our behavioural responses to stress. So we know, um, I mean, I know myself and many people talk about their COVID weight gain that happened during to the you know, changes in, in both alcohol intake and food. Um, substance use um, that, that went out there was you know increasing domestic violence that was occurring out there um, emotional a a disconnection from people as we ran to um, you know escape within uh, our Netflix series or our um, you know our Facebook pages or whatever it might be and of course an increase in dysregulation within households which children um, would have been exposed to. So these are really 
normal but obviously you know over a prolonged period of time really difficult behavioral responses to stress that obviously create and perpetuate more stress so a conceptual framework for the ACE study was developed um, that really was able to start to prove now um, scientifically the links between uh, early adverse experiences and later consequences in terms of health and social outcomes over time. Now this pyramid has, has been adapted um, over the last number of years to look at historical trauma and the impacts of what we call generational embodiment of trauma. So we know in New Zealand we have a lot of historical trauma in terms of the impacts of colonisation. Um, we know a lot of our indigenous cultures around the world have historical trauma that have happened and we absolutely can make the links of how that sets the social conditions in a local context for some of those groups of people that, that become often marginalised in society. Now they become the two first pillars on which adverse childhood experiences are more likely to occur. Um, and then up from that, the risk for that child of disrupted neurodevelopment and then the social, emotional and cognitive impairments that come from that over time, the adoption of health risk behaviours as that young person begins to try to cope with that ongoing assault of toxic stress. Um, and then the disability disease and social problems and risk of early death which uh, you know, is, is apparent um, and has been shown and proven through the studies. One of the, the really sad things that came out of the ACE studies with it, that was they were able to show that people that had six or more adverse childhood experience categories um, with, you know, before 18 uh, died nearly 20 years on average earlier than people that hadn't experienced childhood adversities. So they've been really able to prove that. And look, working in South Auckland for the last uh, 10 or more years and working with a number of people within uh, gangs, you hear that, you know, that is a group that we know um, don't expect to live long ages. And when you ask them what they, uh, how they see their future, they will, you know, those people will very commonly say, I don't have a future, I'm not gonna be around for long. Um, they don't expect to live very long and we very sadly see a, a time and again um, a lot of people within gangs dying at a very young age for a variety of trauma related reasons. So we have to start becoming aware that the trajectories um, following trauma are absolutely beginning to align. You know, these are just sort of three um, samples of data um, around the world that sees that really uh, massive increase in mental health and substance use disorders, um, an increase in diabetes and an increase in, in obesity. And these things are not happening uh, separately to each other. They are absolutely interrelated. There is significant um, relationships between trauma and these and many other increases in poor health outcomes for our populations. So then, you know, this becomes all very, um, you know, concerning and, and heavy, but the really um, amazing thing is that there is a great potential to reduce negative outcomes in adulthood by reducing adverse childhood experiences. And look, this is not necessarily touching on this because this is about reducing um, the number of children experiencing adversity and shifting adversity um, so that kids don't have to go through it and then run into these trajectories. But I think the same can absolutely be said in my experience for um, working to help adults who have experienced adverse childhood uh, experiences um, or trauma and helping them to address the impacts of that trauma and, and work their way out of the vicious cycles they're in. So you can see the predictions here um, by the CDC of the, the potential of reducing significantly depression by 44%, you know, COPD by 27%, kidney disease by 16%, um, reducing the number of people smoking by 33%, heavy drinking by 24%. So these, this is all research predicting the absolute massive impact that we can have um, by really addressing trauma out there in our society. So I wanna just talk very quickly um, to 
one a patient that I've worked with uh, before called Rose, who is really the epitome of, of identifying how trauma can impact and what can happen when we begin to address it. So firstly, um, Rose was 47. She was a mother of three. She was referred to see me by her GP because she uh, was feeling depressed, but um, also they were really struggling to manage her type 1 diabetes. She was in a loving second marriage. Her life appeared to be going well. Um, but as I said, there was a history of depression. So when we looked into Rose's history and I sat down and I did a, a nice assessment with her, we found that she had a really significant history of trauma, um, childhood abuse, um, including sexual abuse uh, significantly. And there was absolutely ongoing suffering well into her adult life. There was also a complete disconnection from herself and her body as well, which often happens with sexual abuse. And what was really sad to discover that was that her poor management of her diabetes was a very conscious choice by her. And it was in fact a way to end her suffering early and skip out of life early. So she never planned to adhere to any of the diabetes monitoring or management or self-cares that she had to undertake to keep um, her, her levels uh, healthy um, because she, she wanted to die early. Um, now, the, you know, the beautiful thing was within a package of six to 10 sessions of uh, really addressing the impacts of that trauma and reconnecting her up to herself, Rose decided that you know, and realized that she hadn't deserved the abuse, that, her, you know, some of the beliefs around the abuse and the way it made her see herself changed. And she began automatically to begin to look after herself and her diabetes and began jumping into all of these um, health behaviors that her primary care team had been working very hard on her to get to adopt over a number of years. So the real basis to that is if we hadn't have discovered the trauma, done some work to support her with it and address the ongoing impact psychologically particularly, we weren't going to be able to reverse the behaviors and that neglect of her diabetes and her GP and the primary care team would have been continuing ba uh, banging their head against a brick wall without seeing any shift. So that's a really important take home point. So uh, before we wrap up, how can you make a difference? So the crux of this is that basically, you know, we are wanting to engender hope for people that have experienced trauma over their lives. Um, and the other most important thing that we're wanting to do is we're wanting to reconnect them back up with themselves. Going back to remembering that trauma creates a disconnection from ourself to cope because we feel overwhelmed by the ch changes in, in our belief systems and the, you know, the overwhelming physical and emotional distress that we experience as a result of trauma. So we are wanting to reconnect back. And going back to Gabor Mate, he says there is a wisdom in trauma when we realize that our traumatic responses and imprints are not ourselves. Uh, and that we can work with them through uh, and thus become ourself. So this is a lot of what the psychological work and, and healing um, through trauma is like. So how can you help? Well, basically, what we need to be adopting throughout the country and throughout the world is, is a, a practice that is infused with trauma-informed care. Um, and trauma-informed care isn't rocket science. It's basically approaching care and approaching everyone that you work with, including colleagues, because, you know, there's heavy rates of trauma, uh, you know, out there within all of us as well. Um, and really identifying the high prevalence of trauma in society, really becoming aware of the very high rates of trauma in the people that you are helping every day, whether they tell you or not whether they are experiencing mental health difficulties or not, whether they are coming in with a smile on their face or not. Um, trauma is very prevalent and we must hold that in mind and we must think about it um, in, in terms of people's presentations. We've got to seek to universally recognize trauma within the lives of people, Fano, and the communities that we serve um, so that we can ensure a provision of safe, supportive, and collaborative care that firstly makes sure that we don't re-traumatize people, um, but also that focuses on interventions that uh, work to heal and help people with the holistic consequences of trauma. So going back to Rose, 
her, her primary care team had never trauma screened her. They had no awareness of the trauma that was there in her histories and the impact it, it had on her physical health, her self-care, her connection with her body, the suicidal ideation that she had and her intention to actively and consciously disengage from her self-care with her diabetes. So all of their attempts to psychoeducate and work with her were falling on deaf ears because they weren't getting to the heart of the problem. They didn't realize what was stopping her from actually helping herself. And I know that a lot of people experience this when things aren't changing with people. People aren't take, getting on board and adhering or being compliant to care. Um, and there are often really understandable reasons why. So if we don't get to the bottom of those, then we can't help. So we have to blow away some of the myths that are there around trauma. Often, you know, um, we believe we make these wrong assumptions that asking people that have vulnerable detailed questions about their trauma history will be too upsetting. We don't want to open up Pandora's box. Interestingly, the studies that have been conducted with people using men mental health services indicate otherwise. It's really important to know that a lot of people, and this is talking about mental health consumers, but moves through to people that aren't necessarily mental health consumers, are in fact upset at not being asked about abuse. So we know that inhibiting or holding back our thoughts or feelings or behaviors that are associated with long-term toxic stress, uh, you know, cause disease. So when we repress and we hold back these things, they begin to show up in our bodies. And we know that not just through somatizing, um, but through actual chronic um, physical health problems. Failure to confront traumatic experiences forces a person to live with them in an unresolved manner. Um, and that is literally like trapping someone within their own uh, personal prison. Not inquiring, also we have to be aware, uh, may further re-victimize the client, colluding with society's denial of either prevalence or impact of trauma. You know, it's very easy for society to pretend to push it under the carpet, to uh, avoid it, um, whether it's over the dinner table or in discussions, but that doesn't change the prevalence and that doesn't change the impact. So people end up having to therefore suffer in silence. You know, and this is the reason behind, you know, adverse childhood experiences have been absolutely linked to suicide and suicide attempts. So people end up suffering in silence. When we open to the depths of our own suffering, because most of us have experienced um, some degree of trauma or, or major distress in our lives, when we don't rush to the normal, when we don't try to push it away or make people feel better, we become open to the suffering of others. So this really is around becoming willing to experience some of the discomfort that sits when uh, you know we begin discussing trauma, but seeing the purpose of it and becoming courageous in ourselves as clinicians. So the basics to trauma screening, firstly, we want to maximize the person's choice and control throughout a screening. Now, just to say, not everyone is expected to screen for trauma. For some of you out there, whether you're a pharmacist or in a position where you're not doing assessments, then having an awareness of trauma and becoming trauma informed by holding it in mind and being aware of people's behaviors and the reactions that there could be trauma behind it is helpful. For those of us who do assessments, um, there is an expectation in trauma-informed care that we will begin trauma screening. So we want to keep people in a place where they feel in control. We want to give them lots of options around um, they're having the right not to answer where that happens, support people, time and place, person. Um, trauma screening is usually limited to only um, a few questions. It's not, doesn't have to be lengthy. When we're screening, we want to screen for a range of different traumas, everything from sexual, physical and emotional abuse to natural disasters, losses in people's lives. Um, and we want to use really clear and explicit language, particularly when we're talking about physical, physical and sexual abuse. Um, has anyone ever touched you in a way that you don't want is very ambiguous. So we want to be brave and we want to use the words that make it very clear what we're asking for so that you encourage straightforward um, 
answers. Um, so here are just some, you know, examples. Have you ever been beaten, kicked, punched or choked or, or significantly harmed physically by another person? Have you ever been touched sexually against your will or been made to have sex when you didn't want to? So they are brave, bold, courageous questions um, that really helps people to understand and have a sense that we are courageous enough and, and open and we want to hear the answers. Um, also, if traumatic events are reported, we want to find out about the recency. Has there been, have you experienced any trauma in the past six months? And of course, are you in any current danger? Are you afraid now that someone might hurt you? Um, the other thing that we need to do is create a safe space for trauma screening within your assessments. So a, a helpful way to open up is um, when you are inquiring about the person over time um, and the best time to do this is when you first meet them and I know this can be hard in general practice because we don't always um, double book appointments to do proper assessments but really if you're taking on a new patient you know we do need to find out as much history as, as we can so asking a really helpful question like what was your childhood like that's nice and open um, how would you describe your relationship with mum and dad that's really helpful to start getting a sense of what that childhood environment and those attachments are and then how will you discipline you know what happened how did mum and dad discipline you and then going into specific trauma questions so it's a funneling um, approach to trauma screening that builds into it and gives also a really nice helpful context um, I always tell people uh, before I do a trauma screen that I screen for trauma as part of my work because that way it helps me to know um, how I can best help people and, and what may be some of the significant experiences that they've had in their life that may be impacted them today that I might be able to help them with. Um, so look, the major take home points from today, uh, because there is a resource that I really would like you to be able to access that goes into a lot more detail on the trauma screening, is firstly, we all need to check our own misconceptions and bias towards trauma screening. We have a lot of myths out there. We have a lot of assumptions that we make um, that just simply aren't playing out to be true in terms of research that stop us trauma screening. And we need to push those aside. If we don't know, we can't help. Uh, we need to work on building a sense of confidence in our own approaches to trauma screening and be able to include them as part of our usual assessment with all the people that we work with. Uh, we need to be aware that when we discover one adverse childhood experience, we need to ask about others and also trauma following into adulthood in the presence of current trauma because it does follow along um, throughout the lifespan. Uh, the most important thing for you guys to know is that you don't have to be a trauma specialist. When people disclose the most important helpful thing that they need is that empathy, that empathic response for you to really show that you're listening and that you want to try to help and some words of validation and support. It's that they are the most essential initial tools and they make the world of difference and can really change people's trajectories having that really positive experience on disclosure. Uh, consider please the relationship between trauma and presenting physical health conditions and I say here put the horse before the cart because in the case of Rose and many other of your patients you won't be able to help people improve their physical health outcomes and adhere to the treatments that you're trying to prescribe them if you don't understand what might be uncoupling everything and and um, and stopping people from making change. So if you're seeing people that aren't shifting trauma screen, get to the heart of the issue um, and ensure that you have a range of trauma support options on hand that you can use, whether that's becoming aware of how to refer for sensitive claims through ACC, becoming aware of your local PHO and the mental health service um, or supports that they offer. The great private therapists that are out there that you can refer people through and develop relationships with those people so that you can, um, you know, keep in contact and collaborate. Um, the psychoeducation that can be really helpful to give people on things like PTSD so they better understand their responses or distress, um, those sorts of things. And the e-therapy tools that are out there that are free, that there, where there are no wait times, um, you know, things like Just a Thought, Beating the Blues, um, 
Mel and some of the other great digital tools that are available and growing out there. So, um, you know, just to finish, the future of any society depends on its ability to foster the healthy development of the next generation. We can't reverse traumas that uh, some of the adults that see us have experienced or some of the children that have already experienced traumas, but we can absolutely prevent the future generations from experiencing trauma by helping the people we're seeing today. So that is the end. There's a few resources there that are going to be sent out to you um, to, to look into, some that are from New Zealand, others from overseas. But thank you very much for your time and please uh, take care of yourself. Anna, thank you. That was an excellent um, overview of, of trauma-informed care. We've got a few questions that have come in. Um, one is uh, more of a specific one. It's about a uh, male that uh, someone's patient, male patient was attacked, um, feeling quite unsupported, getting kind of turned away from a few services was they've not got um, capacity to see him. Um, they are in kind of the Wellington Lower Hutt area. Would you know of any places that they could try and refer this person to? Um, so, you know, in terms of attack, if there was, uh, you know, an attack there that involved the police or not, you know, um, I was thinking victim support may well be an, a, an amazing resource. They have great resources and support people that can help when there's been, they've experienced violence. And um, I believe sometimes through ACC, there can be access to free therapy sessions. Um, so that's definitely one thing to look at. Um, there are also a lot of groups out there um, within the region. So, um, but hopefully the person can access through their PHO. Hopefully there's a package of care that they, um, that you can refer them through to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sorry, I don't know the Wellington region uh, mm -hmm. specifically in terms of resources, but they're just a couple of things to think about. Um, and similarly, some people are finding it difficult to find help for people in kind of rural areas, um, like affordable options and also um, the kind of multi, multi centers um, help. Do you have any suggestions for those people? Um, yeah, I would say um, there are initiatives that are developing. I know 1737 have a counseling service that at the moment is just for um, the Canterbury area that I think was sort of funding in response to some of the earthquakes and I think potentially extended through the um, what happened down there with the, the mosque attacks. So um, I think it's Pua Waitanga. Um, and that was specifically around supporting rural populations. So telephone counselling. Um, I think, you know, uh, and again, you know, not, sometimes this isn't funded, but there are a number of uh, great therapists and counsellors and, and trauma workers that do virtual clinics now. They do online, they do telephone. So that's definitely an option. Um, there, are, there, there aren't necessarily great digital resources out there for trauma at the moment, but I know our team at Just a Thought are looking to bring out a post-traumatic stress resource in the future. We've got a course we're bringing across that's evidence-based from Australia, um, but also um, we're going to develop a trauma response that's just a, a lovely um, overview of how childhood experiences can affect people um, and look at sort of core belief systems, a lot of the stuff that I've gone through tonight. And some of that psychoeducation for people can take them a, a heck of a long way. Um, so um, yeah, look, we are so under-resourced at the moment. We know that we, we spend a lot of money on medications and we know medication does very little when it comes to addressing trauma. So um, there is a big push to get more talking therapies and more supports in terms of Māori services. Um, again, they're, they're growing, but it's really about linking into the, the, the co-papa services around where you live and work because there's more help out there and more community support um, than we often realise because we're not well connected in. So um, you almost need a day to, to be ringing around and, and getting to know the services in your area. But once you do and you have them on speed dial, it's absolutely uh, you know so supportive for your, for your practice and your patients. Um, we've got someone who has a several with their patients, they find if they've had more kind of childhood experience of trauma, they tend to self-medicate a lot with cannabis to try and deal with them. Is that something you come across quite a lot? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's really around uh, trying to medicate that HPA access that's not regulating very well. Um, it's, a, it's a means of escape. Um, mm. You know, 
people that often experience high anxiety states that struggle to sleep. It's constantly used for insomnia. Um, and so it is really challenging. And so, um, you know, and it's difficult because we often go, okay, we need to get you off the cannabis. So let's start prescribing you quetiapine, you know, which unfortunately, you know, we know has a, has a de degree of effect for anxiety and can help people sleep, but it has all the, the metabolic side effects long-term. So yeah, um, look, it's interesting when I've worked with people with substance abuse problems, whether it's alcohol or drugs or cannabis, the most effective way um, without even necessarily addressing the substance abuse itself is to work on the trauma. And, you know, I haven't um, I've been working for PHO psychological services, so I've, I've normally, over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, been restricted to six to 10 sessions, but you can do a phenomenal amount of work, so it really is about pushing through those referrals, and look, we need to lobby our PHOs, we need to lobby our DHBs to release more money into those talking therapy um, uh, funding streams so that we've, you know, we can access more sessions for patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similarly, someone's found that with the alcohol and drug programs, uh, that there's this expectation that the alcohol and drug program should be managed before the trauma, which is an ideal, yeah. <laughs> Not my experience. Um, you know, I, and look, I think a lot of really good alcohol and drug services identify that, you know, the, the, the substance use is a coping mechanism for trauma. And that's the case, you know, trauma is so prevalent with substance abuse. Um, so really, it's, again, putting the horse before the cart. And so it's about finding the right, so it, again, finding the right services, the right clinicians, and um, and pushing uh, sometimes for that, that trauma to be addressed first so that people can better regulate and they don't have to lean on the substances to escape and manage their, their stress. Um, some people are asking if the Wisdom of Trauma film is still available anywhere. Um, looks like it was only available for a week online. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, um, it was. I know it was available up to sort of 24, 48 hours ago because I, I watched it several times. Um, so, and there's been, they've been absolutely overwhelmed. They've had, I think, between four and five million views in the last two weeks across mm -hmm. 240 countries. Um, so, that is going to be accessible. I think uh, get in contact with the guys. I mean, I think really we need to actually push for them to have open 24 hour access. It's something that I would certainly use as a resource for some of my patients that I felt were capable of watching it because it's just got so many amazing psychoeducational messages in it about trauma. But if you haven't already, do anything you can to watch it. In fact, mm -hmm. the Goodfellow um, unit could host a screening. I see that they've uh, got an invitation to open up the movie. Um, so maybe that's something you guys can look at. We'll look into it. Um, in terms of asking people about trauma, there's just a concern that we could kind of re-traumatize people by asking. Is there any concern around that? No. <laughs> look, look, if you if you went about it in the wrong way, if you didn't give the person choice, if you didn't go about it sensitively, if you didn't give the option to not answer and you made an expectation that they must tell you absolutely everything, if you asked to dive down deep into exactly what happened to them, you could re-traumatize them. But we're talking here about a collaborative, sensitive, careful approach, um, giving the, uh, the option to not answer. Um, so, you know, I think our fear and our assumption, which in health and in mental health particularly, unfortunately, when we start getting uh, worried and we start seeing risk, we start becoming risk adverse, so we avoid. Uh, and so we don't ask. Um, I once had a woman in a, tra a nurse in a training say that she didn't think that we should ask people, uh, elderly people, because we don't want to upset them before they die. And it was just like, oh, my God, you know, these people are re-experiencing their trauma on a daily basis, whether they're being asked about it or not. You know, why should these people um, not have a chance to hear that it wasn't their fault or to hear how amazing it is that they've survived or to have empathy and to, to show, um, have experienced someone being there and continuing to support them despite what's happened to them. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, we really have to push that myth aside and just get more, get really comfortable at how we ask. 
um, and doing it sensitively, just like we do when we're doing certain physical examinations. You know, we do it sensitively, mm. we do it thoughtfully. Mm. Um, we had a couple of questions about some people have asked and the patient has disclosed trauma, but they don't want to see a therapist. In some cases, it has been impacting next generation. What, what's kind of your suggested approach there? How much should we push someone to see a therapist? Yeah. Look, it's hard because some people aren't ready and that's another way of avoiding of um, I don't want to see a therapist because I don't want to talk about it or I've seen someone and it wasn't helpful. And really, it's about the planets aligning here. Um, I think if you someone if someone's disclosed to you, firstly, well done, you've asked um, and they've trusted you enough to to um, to, to tell you. Um, and secondly, it's around just holding that space for them providing that compassionate approach, that unconditional support, um, and really engendering hope. And over time, um, you know, you do sort of try to work away and just continue to gently bring it up, offer it again. Um, and, and quite often people will begin to, to want to shift as, as your relationship and trust with them um, develops. All right. Someone has asked, um, have you got any experience using emotional freedom technique? no I haven't I've heard of it and there's a few of those there's tapping um, different things um, and obviously EMDR which is a really brilliant evidence-based approach that we don't have enough of in New Zealand and certainly look I'd say um, you know some people do find some benefit in that and it's something that they can do um, go off and do by themselves but certainly mindfulness meditation um, you know there's a lot of uh, approaches that can be really effective in helping them to learn stress tolerance and that reconnection um, to self. Um, any comments or what's your experience of trauma and persistent pain or chronic pain? Yes, my husband who works for in New Zealand and manages um, injuries could, could talk about some of the discussions he's had with specialists. We know that um, chronic pain and pain is exacerbated with emotional distress. Uh, also, if you're aware, the idea that the more anxious you are, the more you go looking out for um, triggers to that sense of, of, of unsafety that you feel and what you think is going around and going on in the world that's creating that danger. And so if you've got pain, you will be scanning, you'll be more sensitive. And of course, you will pay more attention to it. It will it will have a greater meaning in your life in terms of how you see your future and your ability to cope with it. So uh, absolutely, people are much more at risk of experiencing uh, issues with chronic pain and getting stuck with them. So again, you know, we have to look at helping address the trauma first so they can build that sense of confidence and resilience in themselves and then they can start to step outside and, and, and you know, um, living in that sort of world of pain. Um, you did mention a few resources that will be sent out tomorrow. Um, were there any there or are there any online trauma screen and training available for health professionals? There is. Look, um, Tapo uh, have a great trauma um, informed care training, I believe. The Weary Centre also has one for people that are working specifically with young people. Um, there's an article by John Reed and Co that was produced a long time that's an absolutely phenomenal journal article that's all about the practical how to's of trauma screening. And there are a lot of different. Um, trauma screening and paper version that you can offer to give people if they don't want to do a verbal trauma screening so yeah there, there are a lot of resources out there if you start googling um someone said that they work in a health psychology setting but short term um is short-term therapy an appropriate setting to start going into trauma and addressing trauma Ideally, we want to be doing it in a setting where we have the ability to work with someone over a longer period of time, but let's face it, that's not the reality. Um, ACC sensitive claims can set that up, but it's very hard for people to find a therapist and engage. Um, so I would say that um, absolutely you can start to inquire about that. I mean, I've, like I said, in PHO settings of up to six to 10 sessions, that's all I've had to be working with trauma. Um, and you can, you can, for some people, get potent changes in that time. It's about that whakawhanaunatanga, that connection. It's about 
really providing that context and helping people to understand why they're suffering the way that they are. So they stop feeling so useless and they start to develop some compassion for themselves and what they're going through and engendering hope. And those things are really the, can be the real pivotal points for people that push them into, um, you know, doing so much better and, and being able to hold on until they get longer term treatment or in some cases, um, you know, can be, can be just what they need. Mm -hmm. um, any tips for working with early, early adolescents with trauma but they're not ready to engage with talking therapy? Very hard but I'd say again it all comes back to the relationship look whether or not we're a GP, a pharmacist, a nurse, um, someone on reception in a practice um, our most important aim should be to give people a different experience than what they've had um, most of our trauma comes, unfortunately, from attachment figures, from people that we hold in high regard that should be protecting us, caring for us. Um, and that's some of the most damaging trauma that can occur. So it really is around how we hold that space with patients, um, how we give them that experience of themselves and us um, and give them a different experience than what they've had so that they can begin to um, build a better sense of themselves through their experiences with you um, and a better sense of other people as well. So with adolescence, you know, it really is that building that connection um, until the planets align. And it might be that that young person doesn't jump into working with their trauma as an early adult, but it's amazing working with adults and hearing their experiences of having pivotal experiences with adults along their childhood and adolescence. And they remember those. And they are the moments when they began to really hook in and believe that they could have different experiences than what they've had. So don't underestimate the power of just having that great connection and, and relationship. Um, someone's asked about uh, kind of working with bereaved family members after a death in hospital, particularly when the death was sudden or unexpected. Mm -hmm. Is there a place for preemptive or kind of proactively encouraging them to, to seek support? Um, yes, there are. I mean, there are lots of support groups out there. I mean, certainly um, directly following their seasons, which is, I think, I believe is a national support service specifically around grief. Um, that's there for, there are children's programs and adults programs. Um, but but it really is just as around encouraging um, that initial discussion and not people not setting any expectation of how they should be grieving or how long it should be taking. Um, so having some basic information that you can give out, um, you know, I think that's one of the big things that I do when I work with someone that's only just recently lost someone in quite a traumatic way is really looking at the expectations they're going to place on themselves in the coming months and years. The number of elderly women that I've seen that have recently within the last six months become widowed and come to me and say, I should be over it by now. And you're just like, oh my God, how long were you married? 50 years. You shouldn't be over it by now. You know, or, you know, they're getting upset and they're, and they're still crying and having anxiety and they believe that they're not coping. And it's like sometimes coping includes having panic attacks, includes becoming overwhelmed, includes feeling sad all the time. You know, so it really is about helping to normalize distress responses and help people shift out of that. I should be happy and, and not upset um, mindset. They mm. should. Yeah. Yeah, the shoulds. Uh, yeah. Um, and have you got any kind of comments or experience with the roots of ADHD and trauma? Ah, uh, yes. I was just <laughs> talking about uh, to someone today who I've recently diagnosed with ADHD who has a significant history. Look, I think that we, when we look at the fact um, that trauma can disrupt, disrupt um, neurodevelopment, um, mm -hmm. then I think we can absolutely see a setting for risk of ADHD, particularly if there is a genetic link, because we remember trauma can um, epigenetically affect gene expression. So I think that there is a link. It doesn't mean that everyone with ADHD has been traumatized, but if you look at the impact of trauma on that stress system and even executive function, even if we're thinking about anxiety rather than ADHD, there can definitely be a link. So helping impulse control, helping emotional regulation, helping focus and concentration. If there is trauma there in ADHD, then um, yeah, um, we need to be aware of that. Um, and one more question is, um, from what age do children remember their trauma? 
So there are two important things to think about here. One is, is a conscious remembering um, and a consciousness of trauma. And I, to be honest, I would have no idea because there are lots of um, ch children and teenagers that into adulthood don't remember very much of their lives. Um, and sometimes that can be the impacts of trauma and dissociation, um, for example, um, or, or otherwise. But I think the important thing is that um, you know, we biologically hold on to trauma in our bodies. So in some ways, and if we think about it, we know even though in, in utero, we become programmed to expect the environment we're coming into by the maternal stress system and cortisol levels that we, are, that we experience in utero. So, um, you know, we become wide even before we step into this world to prepare us for our environment. Um, yeah, so um, that's a hard one. Um, because at you know at any age people can remember things, yeah. But but I mean, trauma impacts right bef before birth, <laughs> unfortunately. So, all right, we might wind it up there. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. A big thank you to Anna for such a great discussion. Uh, just a reminder to viewers that this will be online on the Goodfellow website from tomorrow, um, along with a list of any relevant resources. Um, for those um, who missed it and are asking, the movie is called The Wisdom of Trauma. Um, yeah, so have a lovely night, everyone. Thanks very much, Anna. Thank you.